down from heaven. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Al Persson, and we are continuing to look at the doctrine of the Trinity. That phrase, down from heaven, does appear in Scripture and in mostly in John and John chapter 6, and it's worth having a look at today as we expand our knowledge of this wonderful topic. You can contact me at pastor at mascot.church or in the comments below if they are enabled by the time the video gets published. I hope that you're all well. We're continuing our discussion on the doctrine of the Trinity today. And in so doing, we want to, um, as we begin, we want to just go back to our ongoing definition. I did not write this definition, but I do really like it. It comes from Dr. James White. It is this, Within the one being that is God, there exists eternally three co-equal and co-eternal persons, namely the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I think that's a very good definition. It's nice and tight. Of course, it can't contain everything and all that the scripture has to say about that, but uh, it, gets us up, it gets us nicely focused. Now, what approach are we using in these studies? Well, historically, the church, after the scriptures were written, not inspired, not inspired by God as such, but after the scriptures were written, were inspired afterwards, uh, put together some statements or some creeds that were used to answer uh, false teachings or errors or mistakes. Uh, some false teachings or errors were simply just that. They were just um, lack of clarity as, the, as, as time went on. But some of these creeds um, are, many of the creeds are excellent, particularly the creeds that deal with the Trinity in a logical fashion are really wonderful. One of my favorites is the Athanasian Creed. Now, we're using the Athanasian Creed, which was written in, um, it was not written in English, by the way, so it's been translated. If you look it up, you'll find there's some slight variations. Those have to do with translations. We're looking at the Athanasian Creed as our, uh, as our template. And so let's just, uh, just confirm that here. The Creed is called the Athanasian Creed. So it's our framework or our template. We're ticking through the, the creed and we're looking at points that our study will mark off in red. So we began this a, a couple of videos ago, though I'll put them all together in a playlist at a later time. I've got them marked as blue today. So whatever is in blue today is our, our statements that we're going to deal with in our study. And the next time we see the creed published in our next video, well, they'll be red. If they're red, italicized, it means we really haven't done a particularly thorough job in our studies up to this point in dealing with those issues, okay? We have a little bit more ground to cover. So what is going to be our reference? What text are we going to use uh, chiefly today? Where are we going to work from? We're going to work from John chapter 6. And uh, we'll flick back and forth, but spend most of our time in there. And I'll, uh, I'll, I'll no you'll note that as we read the bits of John chapter 6, I don't know how thoroughly we'll pay attention to the unmarked bits, yet this will happen as I fly into the video. You know, I don't like to do recuts and re-edits and so on. I like to hop in, do it, and be sure that it's nice and clean. If there's mistakes in my videos, I tend to leave them and make an apology later or whatever, uh, and you just realize how, you know, it's maybe not the right way to do it, but... Certainly, it's easier than going back and spending a lot of time editing, though that day is coming. Some of you might wonder, what's my arm always doing down on this side? Do I have a problem with my shoulder or my arm? No, that's where my keyboard is, and that's how I flick back and forth on the slides. So I have to look down sometimes. But hey, it is what it is. One day, we might get a studio. Probably not, though. You can do a lot with low-cost equipment as long as ever you, uh, you're patient with it. Okay, John chapter 6. So John chapter 6 is one of the great Trinitarian passages. Uh, Jesus speaks a lot in that passage. He talks a lot about who he is, and he uses some strong metaphorical language, and he uses some very direct language. In John chapter 6, we find Jesus saying that he came down from heaven. And that's very interesting, and it helps us to, uh, to look at this element of his ministry, ask some questions, and then fill in some blanks, as we go on. So let's have a look at this. Let's pop in and where are we up to? Here we go, John chapter six, beginning at verse 35. We're gonna pop on the screen and we'll do a fair bit of reading, but uh, we'll highlight some of the points that we're gonna to address today. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. 
All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out, for I have come down from heaven. Note that I've marked that in red. Not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Now we're going to deal a little bit with this one in our um, Athanasian Creed as well, the will of him who sent me. Here we go, verse 40. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone else has seen the Father except he who is from God. He, who has, seen the, he has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Last verse, last couple of verses. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. For there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who were those who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. Jesus said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. There's a lot in that passage. So in this passage, we see just a couple of points. Every time you see Jesus saying, truly, truly, or verily, verily, he's not changing the subject, but he's referring to what he has just stated. And he says it twice in this passage. It kind of, it helps with the flow of the passage. Jesus is not walking along and all of a sudden, out of the blue says, oh, truly, truly, I say to you. Verily, verily, I say to you. No, he's always reinforcing what was just said. And it's consistent in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, the, the four Gospels. Now, our framework today is the Athanasian Creed. This is going to be our framework for the next four to five weeks while we fill these components in. We're going to look at some elements of the Athanasian Creed and then ask if the past uh, reading in John 6 answers any of those elements. The whole idea is that the majority of the texts by the time we're done will all be marked off in red saying we've addressed those. And then we have uh, kind of rounded out the the Trinity, the picture of the Trinity. Now, there are some elements that we will not address in this study. They're going to get some more time, just like in our Doctrine of God. We talked about the uh, the wrath and the justice of God. These are going to get some more time in more detail, kind of be set aside for a little bit more work and more detail later on. But we will hit the high points quite easily in this study on the Trinity. This is a fundamental study to Christian to our Christian faith. Okay, so the framework that we're dealing with is the Athanasian Creed. And it begins with this powerful phrase. We're not going to read it all here, but just a couple of interesting points uh, for review. Whosoever will be saved before all things, it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith. 
Now we're going to talk about that in just a moment. Which faith except ev- uh, which faith except everyone do keep whole and undefiled, and without doubt he shall perish everlastingly. And the Catholic faith is this: that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in Unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. So a point on the Catholic faith. Most people, when you ask them what their church is, they they'll they're familiar with phrases like, "Well, I'm Anglican." or I'm uh, Baptist, or I'm Salvation Army, or they might say I'm Catholic. Well, really the Catholic Church that uh, you think of down the road that is uh, shows allegiance to uh, the Pope and to Rome and so on is the Roman Catholic Church. Anyone who is a Christian who is in the Kingdom of God, who is in the Church of Jesus Christ, is a member or holds to the Catholic faith. The word Catholic is not a theological word. It's been used in other areas as well. Someone says he he is part of a Catholic organization. What What does that mean? It's global. It's universal. It's broader. Okay. So this reference to the Catholic faith is not a reference to the Roman Catholic Church. It is a reference to all believers, all Christians. And it talks about the fact that this is essential. It's an essential part of Christian doctrine and Christian belief that you hold those elements. Okay, and I personally believe the doctrine of the Trinity, the Trinity, is uh, is essential. Believing that and holding on to that is essential for Christianity. Okay, otherwise I wouldn't be teaching this. That's for sure. Okay, so let's go down and have a look at some of the blue elements here and see if what we have read earlier on answers any of those points. So down here we see that there is one person of the Father. Actually, it's um. Uh, yeah, we can start here. One person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost. But the Godhead, but the Godhead of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Ghost is all one. The glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son. Okay, so in the study that we looked at, we saw one person of the Father. Well, how did we see that? Well, Jesus said that he proceeds from the that he had been sent by the Father and that his will was to do the will of the Father. So we have someone who does the sending and who has a will. So we see a person there, okay? Someone who does the sending, who has a will. So we would say that this one that is marked blue here, according to the reading in John 6, could happily be uh, converted to red for the next time. Looks like we've covered this one off, okay? And such, and this comes on here, such is the Son, uh, such is the Holy Ghost. Now, it says the Father uncreated, the Son uncreated, the Holy Ghost uncreated, the Father incomprehensible, the Son incomprehensible, the Holy Ghost incomprehensible. Okay, so we have the Son uncreated. That is existing before time was, always existing from both John 1 and here. I'm going to mark that off. I'm going to say Jesus was with the Father, came down from heaven. Now, we also notice the Son incomprehensible. I think this one, having a think about it, I think we have better determined here that the Son is incomprehensible than that the Son is uncreated. We might hold that one till next week and make a stronger point for the Son being uncreated, being eternal always was. However, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God is pretty strong. The scripture also says that all things were created by Him. There was not anything that was created that was not created by Him. We'll probably review that next week and we'll pop that one on to the Son uncreated. Okay, but the Son incomprehensible. Well, how can the Son be incomprehensible? How can it be that we cannot understand the Son fully? Well, first of all, He was with the Father. Also in that passage, it says that He's going to return to the Father. He's the bread of life. He has authority to give eternal life. He knows in advance who's coming to Him and who does not come to Him. He calls Himself the bread of life. Those are hard to understand, incomprehensible. How can the infinite Son now be with us on the earth using those titles, being able to give eternal life, being able to give something that is of no end, infinite in its end. How can he do that? How is he able to do that? Incomprehensible. Now, we'll get stronger on the incomprehensible when we look at the union of God God and man in the one person, but we're not quite there yet. But I'm going to tick that one off and say the Son 
incomprehensible. Here's the next slide. There's nothing in blue here that we're going to look at, but we will read it. Yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal. As also there are not three incomprehensibles, nor three uncreated, but one uncreated and one incomprehensible. So like the, likewise, the Father is almighty, the Son almighty, and the Holy Ghost almighty. Yet there are not three almighties, but one almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. And yet there are not three gods, but one God. I think we could, um, we could tick off that the Father is God here, and the Father is almighty, and so on. And we might just do that as a matter of course. But our study today did not particularly indicate those. The next slide. So likewise, the Father is Lord, the Son, Lord, and the Holy Ghost, Lord. Yet there are not three lords, but one Lord. For like as we are compelled by the, by the Christian verity to acknowledge every person by himself to be both God and Lord. So we are forbidden by the Catholic religion to say that there are three gods or three lords. The Father is made of none, neither created nor begotten. The Son is of the Father alone, not made nor created, but begotten. The Holy Ghost is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. Okay, so there's a number of statements there that we, not, we did not directly address. There is something in John 16, I'm sorry, John 6 that talks about the Son coming from the Father or proceeding. We could have ticked that one off and maybe we should. Uh, evidently, there's some ground that we're going to have to cover in the future to say, is the Athanasian Creed uh, biblical across the board? Do all of the elements hold uh, on this wonderful doctrine? Okay, now we're going, to the, we're going to have another look at the next slide, and we're going to say we can tick off one more element uh, for next week or for our next video. Turn one more blue into red. So, there is one father, not three fathers, one son, not three sons. Evidently, we can see that from John 6. Uh, Jesus talks about the father. He is the son, and that's pretty clear. We can tick that one off. One Holy Ghost, not three Holy Ghosts. And this trinity is none of four or other or after other. None is greater or less than another, but the whole three persons are co-eternal together and co-equal. So that in all things, as it is aforesaid, the unity in trinity and the trinity in unity is to be worshipped. He, therefore, that will be saved is... Oh, that's the, my typo. My typo was here, therefore, that will be saved must think thus of the trinity. I thought I'd clear that typo up. Okay, so in that particular past slide, we looked at the fact that there's one father and one son, not three fathers, not three sons. Why are we doing this? Why is this important in the Athanasian Creed? Well, it was important to say that God is one, there's one God in three distinct persons. We have to make that point and drive it home clearly. The reason that we're going through this in this way is to demonstrate that this doctrine has good biblical basis. By the time you've compared all of these passages, you realize that you're in a Trinitarian, um, uh, you're on a Trinitarian journey, and it's impossible to escape that. And that's why this study is so important. Okay, now let's go on to our next slide. This is interesting. Further, it is necessary to everlasting salvation that he also believe rightly the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you remember Jesus' comments in John 6, you must, uh, you must believe that he's the bread of heaven. You have to consume that, be part of that. Now, what's that mean? Well, it does not mean physically eating the bread and drinking the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a euphemistic language where he talks about partaking in the covenant that he offers. We see that in other scriptures. I do believe that we will have to do a, a, a couple of videos on, on the uh, Lord's Supper, on communion, how that works, what that's all about. And you'll see quite clearly that this isn't a physical consumption of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, there are some Christians who hold to that, but uh, Christians like myself do not. We do not believe that's a good interpretation of this passage. Nevertheless, partaking of Christ is what brings you eternal life. If you do not believe that he uh, came to this earth, he was incarnated in this earth, uh, you have no chance of eternal life according to his own words. So I think this top italicized section can be turned into red, maybe with red italics, so we can make it a little clearer next time along. Okay? For the right faith is that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God and man. God of the substance of the Father, begotten before the worlds, and man of the substance of his mother, born in the world, perfect God and perfect man, of a reasonable soul and human flesh, subsisting. 
Okay, so we are in a place where we can mark off the man of the substance of his mother born in the world. Jesus said, I came down from heaven. I'm in the world now. Of course, that was at this point, at that point when he spoke. So uh, we are able to tick that off. Yes, he didn't come and stay as a supernatural being only. He came, he is always God, but he came in humanity. Jesus said, I did not come to earth to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a payment or as a ransom for many. Are you included in that many? Have you accepted his payment for the forgiveness of your sins? That's the real critical question. That's really why we do all of this. We do all of what we do for the glory of God, so that God is honored and glorified. The message that we preach is that you and I cannot save ourselves from our sin and that eternal life only comes by trusting in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the message that we preach. The additional message that we preach is that we need to walk with him and talk with him along life's narrow way. And that's the purpose and the duty and the wonder of the scriptures to teach us and to instruct us. People like myself who are honored to be able to, uh, to teach the scriptures, blessed and honored beyond belief, are part of the of the whole package of helping God's people to grow and to be able to walk with him and talk with him uh, more and more. So, you know, we, I'm, I'm just honored to serve you here and to do that, okay? So as we, um, as we continue and go on, the, um, the Athanasian Creed is going to, uh, to be flushed out and to be filled out. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, flushed out and filled out, I don't know. What we're going to do is we're going to turn more and more of those texts uh, from white into blue, then into red, saying, all right, we have accomplished and we've looked at all of those. Now, there's probably, a, there are a couple of questions that I'd like to, uh, to address or a couple of points I'd like to build on after all of this. The Bible talks about two types or kinds of death, at least in this, com in this set of scriptures. He's talking about two kinds of death. He's talking about physical death and spiritual death. How can you live forever if you're going to die? Elsewhere, the Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. Once to die and then the judgment. Okay, so I'm going to die and then judgment. And, and well, how can I live forever if I'm going to die? How can I live forever if I'm going to die? How can I consume? I know lots of people who have come to Christ. They have walked with him and talked with him. They're dead now. I thought they were supposed to live forever. Okay, that's a good question. Now, it's important to realize that God is talking about two kinds of life and two kinds of death. I'm going to take you to a passage a little later in the book of John, which is from John chapter 11. We'll read it carefully, and it will help us to round this out. Jesus' good friend Lazarus had died, and Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And he's speaking to Lazarus' sisters at this time and to the audience prior to the resurrection of Lazarus, and listen to Jesus' words here. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, Yet shall he live. I just doubled that here just for emphasis. Realize that was incorrect paste, but good to read it twice. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Okay, so let's just read the, from Jesus said to her. Ignore the fact that I've accidentally done a double paste. Here we go. Jesus, this is from verse 25 and 26. We'll read it in one section. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Now, Jesus' audience, the people that he was talking to, had long, have long died. Their bodies have long gone. They're, they're out of the picture altogether. But they're still alive. They believed in him. They trusted him for eternal life. Jesus said, If you believe in me, you will never die, or you will live forever, even though you die. 
I'm asking you, ladies and gentlemen, are you ready to die? I met a lady the other day. We had a conversation kind of cut off, and I'm hoping to be able to uh, catch her again and, uh, and, and follow on the conversation. She said to me, I, I don't really have anything to live for anymore. I'm, I'm ready to die. I just want to go. And uh, either it was that I was distracted or something was wrong. I missed asking her the question. It was just odd that I normally, I think, would do this. And the question would be, well, what's going to happen to you when you die? I'm not sure she thought about it. I'm very keen to find out how someone can be so ready to die and yet so unaware of what's going to happen afterwards. Well, I think I've been a good person. I'm going to go to heaven. That's not enough. Do you trust the Lord Jesus Christ to have forgiven your sins. By her own story, she has not been a good person all her life. And so that won't be too hard to test her in that respect. So I'm trusting that I'll see her in the next few days again, just bump into her and be able to, um, to continue that conversation and ask her the question. Now, Jesus said, if you believe in me, I've come down from heaven. You consume the bread of life. You, you partake in the life that I have to offer you. You'll never die. You'll live forever. Will your body die? Yeah. But that's not the part of you that goes on and lives forever. I'm offering you a, a very, very important question today, ladies and gentlemen. And the, the question is based around, the, it's based around whether, whether or not you want to live forever. It's pretty important. I think it's pretty direct. Well, how do you live forever? By receiving the work, the payment that the Lord Jesus Christ did for you. Receiving the price that he paid for you. Uh, understanding that he died in your place. We come back to the scripture so often repeated here. Jesus said, I did not come to earth to serve. I'm sorry, I did not come to earth to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom, as a payment for many. When speaking to Nicodemus, he said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, or only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In John, in John 11, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though, yet, though he were dead, yet shall he live. If you believe in me, you will never die. You'll live eternally. What will happen after your body goes? You'll be immediately in glory with him. We're looking at the doctrine of the Trinity. Salvation does not come apart from understanding that the Father and the Son, what? That's a bit much. But once we understand the scriptures, we realize that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are one in bringing salvation to you. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Son. But the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. We've been looking at the doctrine of the Trinity today. We have seen that the Lord Jesus Christ has come down from heaven. My name is Al Persson. You can contact me at pastor at mascot.church. We'll come back to our Trinity studies next week.